Hi, I'm Mike Messier, and welcome to Short Film Showcase, where we feature the very best short films and their filmmakers from New England and across the world. On this episode, we have some great short films and two in-studio guests. First, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Vincent Perrone, Jr. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. I'm glad to be here. Now, this is the first time we've met. And, sure uh, is. Right away, I'm caught by your charisma and your style. Obviously, you dressed up a little bit better than me for this show. Well, I try to look a little <laughs> nice. You know, I'm going to be on the, on the internet, so I had to look a little presentable. You look great. That's Thanks. Great. I appreciate and, and, it. And how did you get involved in acting, Vincent? Well, um, I actually started acting when I was in high school. I did a TV film studio course when I was like a freshman in high school. And um, my class actually made a short film, and I was the lead role in it. And ever since then, I was like, I love being in front of the camera because I feel like my charismatic or bubbly personality <laughs> actually works really well on camera. And being social, I'm hoping that that's what helped me go in the right direction. So as a young guy starting off, and we, we talk about this off camera, Yes. As an actor, you don't want to give out your age, but as Correct. a, say, a younger guy, yep. you're coming up and, and, and you're watching, uh, anything inspire you to get involved in acting? Like any movies you saw as a young kid or anything that really clicked in um, with you? Not, I, I mean, I, like anybody else, I love watching movies in general. I'm, I mostly like action and horror movies and comedies, but um, actually it's mostly actors I saw, like um, if I can use the name, like Ryan Reynolds, he's like my idol as far as acting. A lot of people don't think he's a good actor, but me, I think his, the way his personality is on camera is like how I am in real life, and I'm hoping that one day that's how I'll be as well. Like even if it's action, comedy, whatever, he always fits that certain role, and I think I'm pretty much the same style. That's great. Of acting. Good for you, man. Because yeah. there, there are a lot of actors like a Ryan Reynolds, but he, he got very serious in a movie called Buried, I believe. Where right, was which was awesome. I thought that was a great movie. And again, that shows that he has a great aspect of acting other than always doing comedies, you right. know? So hoping, I mean, I would like to be in a comedy or action movie as well, but I mean, I'm very diverse in a lot of stuff as well. So hopefully people will see that and want to use me for everything. And you and I were talking off camera and we shared some uh, war stories basically, which is like, the support or lack thereof of, of actors. Yeah, from, I mean, it, yeah. It, it, it is tough. I mean, I'm sure everybody knows that being an actor is very tough, or being in the film industry is actually very tough to be in. And um, a lot of support, I mean, a lot of people feel that acting, if you're not making a feature film and making blockbuster movies and making millions of dollars is not important or something you should do. But my my understanding is that I love doing it. It's a hobby. Hopefully, it'll be a career for me one day. Um, it would just be like anybody else, like any kids that play baseball or hockey, and their parents pay money to get the equipment or pay them to travel or do all these things and cost money, and they're not professional athletes, but they do it anyways. I feel like acting is the same aspect for me. I enjoy doing it. It gets me out the house, and I get to meet a lot of great people. So I feel I have my own family, which... They support me, but I understand they want me to have a career to fall back on in case it doesn't work out. But I feel that once I get out there and I'm with like-minded people, I feel like filming and actors are also my family as well. That's great. Yeah, we we talked about that also. Like uh, yeah. the on the stu the production is a family when it comes together the right way. Yeah, and that's very important. I am. Um, I don't know because I haven't been in like big blockbuster feature films. I'm not sure if they work the same way, but I feel like a lot of indies, at least independent films, I feel like they're um they're more home to family and trying to get everybody to get along. Because I feel that everybody gets along. Actors, directors, cameramen, lights, whatever. Everyone gets along. It makes for a smoother and better production overall of a film. Great. And you did some work. Uh, on a piece called Permanent, is that right? With uh... Uh, Correct. Yeah, I actually um, was a friend that told me about the film, and he was looking for featured extras, and I was like, yeah, let me throw it in there. So it was either Young Jogger, Young Girl, or Mafia Guy, and I was like, I'm Italian, so obviously <laughs> I was like, I'll go for the Mafia type guy. Right. And um, I woke up, they told me, uh, actually before I woke up, <laughs> they told me to be there at 6 a.m., and I live three hours away. It's in Salem, Mass. So I woke up at 2.30, got ready, got there like 10 minutes early because I always try to be professional. I always try to be early and on time. And um, other people didn't show up, so I ended up getting more on screen time than I was supposed to. So in the end, I feel like my dedication actually worked in my favor in that aspect. Yeah, what we're talking about today with you a lot is just the right attitude, the right, right positive mental attitude and yeah. the right uh, ambition and, and being professional and 
like you said, you're coming from uh, where in Connecticut? Um, actually, East Haven, Connecticut. East Haven, Connecticut, yes, which if you're working for people in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, is quite a bit of a drive. So. Yeah. Um, the thing is, again, is I'm, I'm very passionate about it. It's something I like to do. So driving, driving two hours, three hours, four hours, to me, that's not that's not a big deal. The big deal is actually being on camera and doing something I enjoy. So, the the miles driving is not really anything I really worry about. I mean, yeah, obviously driving four or five hours is time consuming and very tiring, but um, in the end, I feel I'm doing something I love. So. That doesn't really affect me in any way. Let's take a look into the future of Vincent Perone Jr. And what you say, five years from now, three years from now, where are you? What are you doing? Hopefully making big budget films and enjoying it. Um, I feel like if, if I was to do feature films, like as a profession and everything like that, I would hope that I wouldn't be as arrogant as some people who are, you know, up there. I would try to take like my friends and family and I would still try to support fellow actors that help me now. I mean, there's a lot of actors and directors who worked on multiple things and they met me a couple times and they, they like me and they're always trying to help me out here and there and it makes me feel good because I hope that when I get to a certain spot, I can either help them or in turn help somebody else who's maybe having a struggle with the acting. So I'm always looking to give back. Pay it forward. That's great. Yeah, I mean, again, if it's not paid, as long as it's something I like doing, I really don't mind it. That's really cool, Vincent. And uh, we're talking about some of your other projects, uh, The Realm. You want to talk about The Realm a little yeah, bit? Yeah, actually, that's a cool project. I um, almost We're almost finishing up the half the season right now. It was a web show ba made by um, Butterfly Films. They're also from Connecticut, so I was finally happy to get a local right, production, right. you know, yeah. to not drive as far. It's still an hour, but it's better than nothing. Um, it's actually like a sci-fi fantasy. It's about like witches and stuff like that. So it's going to be pretty awesome. I'm hoping that people are into it. My character is actually the second male lead. So this web show is the first web show I've been on. It's the first time I became like a major character. And it's also the first time I had my on-screen kiss with one of my co-actors, I guess you can say. How did that go? And honestly, because... A lot of people say, oh, kissing must be fun on camera, no big deal. Yeah. But there can be that apprehension, that nervousness, the chemistry, and, right. and you don't want too much chemistry, but you know what I mean? So right, right. how did that go for you? It actually, it caught me off guard because it kind of was like thrown in because the, when you write a script, it's very like blocky-ish because you, it's not, you know, you're trying to get the dialogue out. Then you have to add actions later on when you're on film. And it was kind of like the director's like, you guys got to kiss now because you guys are a couple. And it caught me off guard. I actually forgot my lines. Wow. So I had to take a step back and be like, listen, guys, I apologize. Let's redo it. And we did it a couple times. I, kinda, I got more comfortable as it went on, but it's definitely not easy because somebody that I, I may have met her a couple times, it's kind of like you're kissing a complete stranger and you got to right. act like you knew this person for a long time. But I enjoyed it. I hope there's more to come. And I feel like after this milestone, I feel, I feel more comfortable if I had to do it for other roles now. Okay, that's good. Yeah, because a lot of, you know, the top actors always have those stories about first on-screen kiss or love scene and stuff like that. Yeah. And it does, it can be complicated and, and so it is a good accomplishment for you to get through that. Yeah, it, 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 like I said, it was kind of nerve-wracking because it was my first time. But um, she actually was really good. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, we can do more as, as affectionate scenes. Because I feel like my, my characters are always, like, villains. Or right. I'm, always like, I'm always, like, the bad guy or the, the guy that's, like, mean to everybody. And I'm hoping that this show will help me get, like, a more broad end of character that I can be affectionate or passionate about women or anything else, you know what I mean? I do, that's great. Now let's talk about, this is an interesting one, The Folklorist. You did something in Newton Mass, a web yes. series called The Folklorist. Yes. Talk, me, talk to me about it. Um, I actually, well, I use um, New England Films to, to get a lot of my things and I happened to see that they were looking for young guys, you know, and um, to play British soldiers. So I was like, you know, I'll give them a shot. I'm pretty dark for a British soldier, but I give them right. a shot anyways. And they, they, they contacted me probably about a week later and told me they were interested. And I went there, and it was, it was pretty nice. They had a nice TV station, and they had the costumes. And again, I was, I was the first one there, and I actually met one of my good friends that I've been friends with him for about two years since the show, actually, the episode came on air. And um, I just connected with everybody, and it was fun. And I actually got a lot of screen time on that, too. So... I'm, I'm getting this weird vibe that if I keep going up, showing up on time or a little early and just have that charismatic attitude and that can-do attitude that it'll get me more roles just based on that. 
Well, a lot of it, um, you know, from my experience in uh, entertainment is people that are likable are going to get the work. People that have a good attitude and have the talent and the skill set to back it up. But if, if you go in there with a rotten attitude or you're unlikable, then you're not going to get very far right. in this uh, industry. So I, I think it's great. Um, and uh, finally, this piece, it, 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 you know, I ask the same question that other people do no problem. about the, uh, the copyright, but the Cape Crusader Darkest Hour is just, just touch up that for a little moment. That's a, kind sure. of a fan. So now I understand right. it now. It's a fan piece. So right. that the yep. people making the Cape Crusader realize that they don't have copyrights. Correct. To, right. But they yeah. actually, the thing is, um, they made their own symbol and everything, and they made certain things that they can profit from, if you say, or they can use. But the, f the film itself is strictly fan film. They're not making any profit off the movie. It's just um, the guy, Tommy, a, um, from On Edge Productions, they just felt that he wanted to do a movie, and they told him he couldn't do it. And so one day he's like, I'm going to make a Batman film. And here it is, you know, it's underway. We finished, it took about eight months to film. Yep. I was actually only supposed to be really like an, an extra and they kept adding more people, but I ended up becoming a feature extra me, um, a couple of my other co-stars, co, uh, I guess you can say. And so, um, again, I got more on screen time and I just, I can't, I can't badmouth a lot of these productions, to be honest. I think they're all really great. And um, that was actually like one of the first films that was really like serious. Like they had a, like a solid budget and they had a lot of s serious locations and everything like that. So it felt like a real Hollywood production. I was really happy to be a part of that. That's great. Vincent, I mean, just looking, um, and you've done some modeling in your, in your career too. Yeah. Right? You modeled for a couple of years? Yeah, when I was, uh, actually when I was in college, I took a lot of um, film. I actually have my uh, bas uh, bachelor's, I have my associate's degree in broadcast communications. And um, because I felt being an actor, I need to get a more wide variety of skills and why not learn how the cameraman catches me on camera, how the light works, other people that work behind the scenes to hopefully make me a better actor overall to understand what they go through. And um, one of my teachers told me that a great way to try to get into the acting industry is to start modeling. Okay. And so he was like, you're a pretty good looking kid. And I was like, you're kind of weird, but <laughs> I'll do it anyways. Right, right. And um, I felt, but to me, modeling just wasn't my thing because it's, it's pretty much like anything. It's like a style, like one day you're in and one day you're out. Right. And like you have to have a certain look. And I feel acting is more based off your skill. Yes. You can have a look. But as long as you're skilled, they can change it to best fit you if you fit the character better. Modeling, you have to have the look or it's, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, it's more, uh, you know, modeling's great. But, I mean, I think with acting, you put more uh, depth of spirit right. and soul into it, perhaps. Correct. Um, okay, this is fantastic. Now, you wanted me to mention uh, New York Castings. Uh, All right, that's actually, I just signed up for it. Um, I, I took also an acting class because one of my uh, fellow actors, his name is JP, he told me about this acting class and when I went to take it, I had a, like a one-on-one -on -one talk with the teacher and he recommended that website because it's, he, he uses it a lot and it's, it's actually quite convenient for him because where my, I am, I'm only like an hour, maybe an hour and 15 from New York City. Nice. So I'm hoping that I get a lot more more jobs. Not so much paying. I mean, obviously, anybody would like paying because sure. to, to pay bills or pay for gas. But just to get more myself out there, because you know, New York is close to as close we're going to get to LA, at least on the East Coast for now. So I'm hoping that I'll get more gigs and build myself up. What I like about you is you, you do have this attitude that you're willing to to put the miles in, the hours, and the time, in, and the patience to realize, hey, you know, walking in to a situation where uh, you don't know everybody or they're not mm -hmm. familiar with your work, uh, you have to kind of start at those early rungs and build your way up. Right. So I like that. It's like, it's like anything. I mean, you're not going to go and go be a professional baseball player. Just come up, wake up tomorrow and go out there. You have to practice. You got to be on a team. Sometimes your team is horrible. Sometimes your team is good. It, it all depends. So I feel, I feel that because people don't really believe in me and that a lot of people or you know they're always trying to keep me down or right. because there's always those haters you know like yeah. oh you're going to be in a film i never seen it so obviously you're you're nobody to me that that gives me more drive to believe more in myself and so i feel that if i go there and i just act like myself i show everybody that i'm really nice and personable and i get along with anybody i feel that that'll that'll really help me at least get more filming under my belt because they'll be like, wow, that guy was really nice to work with. He was fun to be on set and he didn't give us any trouble and he was professional. So I always try to keep that in mind because it is a profession. 
and you got to be professional to an extent. So I'm always trying to do that. The good thing with you is, like you see, you, you're an hour, hour and 15 minutes outside New York City. So right. that's pretty exciting. So you could, you know, in the near future, you start taking a class there, maybe you right. start meeting some agents. and That's what I'm hoping. You know? That, see, that's the thing. It's, it's funny because everyone's like, I, all my films, I've been to New Hampshire, I've been to Vermont, I've been to all over Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Philadelphia, you know, Pennsylvania and all that. And everyone's like, why are you go all over and you're right next to New York? Because I feel like... I need a lot. I need more practice. I need something under my belt because there's a lot of people that just wake up and they're like, "I'm going to New York or right. I'm going to L.A. and I'm going to be famous," and they're stuck doing nothing, claiming they're actors or actresses, and they're waiting tables. I didn't want to do that. So what I feel like I'm trying to do is I'll build up myself around here, get a little recognition around this area, and then I'll move to New York, which now I have a lot of stuff under my belt that I can use, build up that way, and either stay in New York and get famous from there, or fly to New York, uh, LA and get famous that way. So I'm trying to do it the best I can. I'm not gonna like throw everything out and like live in my car and hopefully get discovered. I'm trying to do it logically as best I can. Let me ask you this, a uh, philosophical question. Is fame your goal? Is that what your goal as an actor or is it something like that? Different? The thing is, I feel like when people think of fame, they think of like money hungry people or mm -hmm. somebody that wants to be like that. I, uh, I think I just wanna be famous, not because I want my name known, but I just feel like you need to be kind of famous to be in, in this industry. Right. And I always had a dream of being a famous movie star. But okay. the money is not a, big, not a big deal to me. And if I had a lot of money, I would definitely try to help everybody as best I can that's close to me or anybody, like I said, that's starting out. But fame is definitely something that I think is everybody's dream, whether it's an athlete or you're a famous lawyer or a cook or anything. I feel famous somewhere somebody wants it, and I'm that person. Well, you're honest about it. Yeah. A lot of people uh, will put on pretense like, hey, I'm in it for the art. And, you know, some people are. I, I'm in it for the art. But also the, the recognition that comes with fame, exactly. if we put it that way, can help you get the bigger projects. Correct. Give you that freedom of, of financial freedom. Right. To help people with charity, as you mentioned. Yep. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No. And plus, like... Unfortunately, like I, I'm like completely opposite. Like I, I, I'm like a nerd. I play video games. I like comic books and stuff like that. So, artsy person, not really me. Like I don't do poems, but like I don't do poems or write music or draw or anything like that. But as far as acting, I guess that's like artsy to me. So, uh, and uh, like when you said about fame, acting and fame kind of go hand in hand. But as far as like the artistic part, I mean, I kind of understand it, but I, I, it's just something I like to do and I happen to be good at it. So it's not like I was like in art class or I was a, um, a drama student and I was like, that's what I want to do. See, as an acting coach myself, I see a guy like you. I'm like, you know, I could really work with this guy because, you know, you start feeding this guy uh, Vincent Prone Jr.'s books like The Intent to Live, Larry Moss, you know, uh, Uda Hagen's books, mm -hmm. uh, Audition, Michael Sherloff. And I can see you as a young guy with so much energy and ambition mm -hmm. and creative energy to just really suck in these books, you know, and the classes with Reno right. Venturi at the Actors Gym. Yep. You mentioned you took a class with him. Sure did. So all, you're doing all the right things. You just got to do more and more and more, right? That, that's what it takes. <laughs> I mean, it's it, Rome wasn't built in a day. I guess that's just the logic, right? And um, right. I'm hoping that being the way I am, trying to be determined as I can't also work in a full-time job because it's not my career, unfortunately, and um, just trying to strive, getting whatever I can to hopefully build up to one day be up on the big lights and, you know, big productions and stuff like that. I just hope that if I do become there, I hope everyone understands that I, I won't forget them because I get that a lot with, like, coworkers and stuff, like, oh, you're going to forget us. I'm not like that. Right. You know, I, I'm always trying to help everybody out. Even right now, I try to help everybody out, and I'm, not, I'm nobody. So hopefully when I am become somebody in other people's eyes, hopefully that they'll still know I'm still the same person. Let me ask you this. You have about 30 seconds. If you have something you want to say to anybody out there who's making films or uh, young actors coming up or uh, people that might be casting looking for a guy in your range, what do you want to say to them? Um, I guess like all I can say is that if you guys are looking to cast me, um, you can go on my Facebook to find me, Vincent James Perone Jr. at Facebook. Um, I'm a really easy guy to talk to, and if anybody has any problems with acting, directing, or anything, and you feel like you need to talk to me, I'm always willing to help out because being a social person, I know a lot of people that are in the same field, and I can probably help them as best I can, but just don't give up because I'm not giving up. No matter how many people tell me I should, I'm not giving up, so nobody should give up either. Love it. 
Great right, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vincent. I really appreciate it. Right now on Short Film Showcase, we're going to take a look at some short films by Jim McDonough. Jim's done some great comedies. Let's check out some of his short films right here on Short Film Showcase. Hi. Do you like humans? Do you like bobblehead dolls? I make bobblehead humans. I make bobblehead doll humans. Buy some human bobblehead, please. Human bobblehead. Please buy my human bobbleheads. Reporter Carl Plum is apparently being held against his will in the jungles of Guatemala. Huh. Hmm. Just take the gun out of your mouth. No. More on this as the story develops. Hi, I'd like to get a small cup. So what movie are you seeing? I'm seeing in the English patient, the reissue of the English patient. What are you seeing in 3D? Why would I possibly see that movie in 3D? Can, can I just get a small Coke? Well, this is the small. No. And this is the medium. Fine, fine. Yeah, in a, in a small popcorn. I'm, I'm in a rush here. This is the small. But for a dollar more, you can get the medium. And this is the medium. No, no. It's the small is fine. It's just a doll. Yeah, I could not eat One that. doll. Just please, please just ring me up. I'm in a rush. But for a doll more. Enough already. But for a doll more. No. But for a doll more, you can get a popsicle. No! I'm gonna blow my tongue. For the love of God, just ring me up, please. Enough. But for a doll more. But for a doll more. Want a popsicle? It's just a doll. Twenty-eighth, nineteen fourteen. World War One begun. February tenth, nineteen eighty-nine. The fly two came out in theaters, and also thirteen point seven billion years ago. The Big Bang created the universe. In Saturn news, the show was canceled.
In 1992, the show was canceled. But I still perform it. I hope you like my show. Right now on Short Film Showcase, we're going to take a look at the preview for Alone, a short film by our producer Brian Casey. Let's check out the preview for Alone right here on Short Film Showcase. Never needed the government for anything. And the one time in my life I did, it failed me. The state's all gone to hell. 10% unemployment. It's getting desperate out there. I am begging you, please. You think you're going to get enough to cover four months? A mother shouldn't need her son to bail her out. I guess you don't need to tell you it's tough out there. I haven't seen you for months. How have you been? You went back. Well, I don't have many options. Yeah. Where am I supposed to go? So your aspiration passed you by And you lie in bed of content You busted all your life one of the worst things about being homeless, While you, were talking, babe, you have to pretend you are not. Right now on Short Film Showcase, we have a very special in-studio guest, Roman Vangeli. How you doing, Mike? I'm good. How are you? I'm bad. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you because we are one of the first guests that bring, brought me a present. Yeah, brought you a present. Now, can I open this? You can open it. Okay, good. Let's check this out. It's actually super glued, so you'd have a problem with yeah. trying to open it. Yeah, <laughs> I have a lot of problems. This is going to be cool. Oh, this is fantastic. Well, you know, you know me very well. We got the, the King of Hearts, Owen Hart. Oh, Sid Vicious. Sid Justice, very good. Oh, you're hitting the sweet spot. You really. Oh, the one Nikolai your question. Volkov. Yeah. Yep, yep. I looked at all your comments on the page. I started, and then I figured, all right, you didn't know who that really was, so I give it to you. And then that was your double like for the one heart, and that's just some. I got that in a lot. It's a bunch of figures together. I think somebody made and well, made I wanna... their own animal. Thank you so much, Road Warrior Animal. For for those that know me well, know that I'm a big wrestling fan, and uh, this this means a lot. So I'm going to hold on to these guys. Uh, while we talk. So, yeah. um, you started off in the fashion industry, is right. that correct? Right. Tell me a little bit about your work in fashion. I started off in uh, 2006. I was just basically looking for, I wasn't even looking for like modeling work, I was looking for extra money during uh, school. And I found Craigslist like a modeling thing for a nightclub fashion show. So I did that and then I did some more like smaller shows and started performing the biggest shows throughout New England in the first two years. I was crowned uh, Best Female Model of New England in 2007. Uh, then I expanded to New York and did you know, different shoots, commercial shoots, all different types of things, as much work as I can get. Um, and then, which, at the end of that, I, I decided I wanted to, you know, end that in 2010. Did my last big show at Twin Rivers for about 2,000 people. And I figured I wanted to be behind the scenes and start producing the fashion shows. 
Um, originally going to school in New York just for production, like the fashion shows. I had, had some minor film stuff in there. So we started the reality show based on behind the scenes, the model singers and dancers, which years later led up to all this, which is strange. How right, right. <laughs> all that from like what happened, we started the work mall, we did the casting in the mall and everything. Well, now it's like, all right, how do you go from that to like kind of a thriller? Film. <laughs> You're talking about redemption. Right. Well, obviously, the film's not based on any of those characters from before, but kind of like the concept that me and Mickey went through in real life. That right. brought, we kind of expressed our emotions into these characters with redemption. Now, this is the redemption <coughs> that people uh, in New England are getting to be real familiar with you guys. Mickey uh, Mons, I believe is his last Montez. name. Montez. Montez, <laughs> yeah. Mickey Montez, <laughs> yourself. And um, for those that want to find out more about what we're talking about right now, Redemption, they should look it up, Redemption AD on Facebook. Where yeah. should they go? Redemption AD is the actual profile, and then there's the Evangelion team page, which has all my fashion updates and everything else as well. Now, this story, uh, and people may know that I've been involved uh, in some extent, is, is really the passionate story that comes from you and your friendship with Mickey. And you guys have been through a lot of stuff together. Right. And tell us more about how friends, really almost brothers in real life, manifest this project and how it comes to be? Well, the real life part of where the story is right now. The real life. Let's start with the real life. In real life, uh, I was doing a behind the scenes thing, a reality show filming at uh, Twin Rivers. It was a big show and I asked him to come down because he's always, he's always good with like speaking with everybody and like, you know, character building on, and just really talking like emotional, like speaking and stuff like that. So I figured it'd be good for him to come down to talk with the cast about life and things like that, like just all positive stuff. And then a couple weeks later, I said, I'll come back down again. and. He kept coming back down, and then the next thing you know, it turned into a, he's part of the team, and we became partners on it. Yeah. We were actually, we were never that close originally, uh, all those years, with, you know, with this until we started working on this. This actually brought us, our friend, you know, friendship, like the whole brotherhood, kind of closer. Because really, we'd see each other maybe once every couple months. Um, and then we started just working on this, working on this, and we had no idea what we were doing at that point. Right. Sometimes we still have no idea what we're doing, <laughs> it seems, but... Yeah, if anything, that the, these projects since 2011, between, from the reality show to turning from film to then the rewrites, it's, it's brought us actually, you know, closer together. That's important. <laughs> right. And, and the people that you've brought into Redemption and now Redemption <coughs> AD, um, really passionate people. I right. mean, from, from top to bottom. And, and tell us, where does the project stand right now? Well, first of all, tell us what the project's about. What is the movie about? Well, from last time when we left off with you, it uh, was a different, totally different story. Yeah. I want to make it, I want to, originally I was set in horror. But I wanted to take away from horror. I felt I wanted to just kind of leaving it with one gender. I want to make it more, you know, more viewers, like a bigger demographic. So it's a, like real life events now. So for example, like Russia, the Ukraine, the Malaysian plane, all that stuff's tied into this. Conspiracies, 9-11. Uh, all stuff that's happening in real life is tied into this with these characters now. Uh, with this, like where it is with the prison there, because I'm not sure if you've seen the screenshots or anything like that, what we've been filming. You're probably like, all right, what's this about? What are these right, guys right, right. doing? And <clears throat> this is more or less kind of an origin of where these characters all came from, from the footage that you've watched with me and that we've worked on together. Right. Where it's like, all right, these people, how they even, how did it start? So <clears throat> we're actually, we're actually filming two movies at once right now. Wow. I mean, even though obviously I want to make the goals complete one movie, but there's some footage that wouldn't be able to use in this one that makes sense. Like, all right, this will work perfect for a sequel if we went that way. So we have some extra footage when we need. But uh, it's more or less the six prisons that. They have this, they all have one, one thing in common, whether it's, um, so you know, they're, they're all different. One's paralyzed in a wheelchair from the like, waist down. Others have mental disorders. One just got, went to prison because he has post-traumatic stress from being in the military, and he had a steroid abuse problem, and he ended up, you know, killing his wife, and mm -hmm. he ends up in jail. That's my character, Damien. Um, there's no more Christian at this point. Yeah, Yet. Well. <laughs> I'll say, maybe, he might come back some okay. point during the movie, but yeah, at this yeah. point, uh, Christian's, he doesn't exist at this point. Yeah. So, uh, He's the last inmate to join this, this group, and all of a sudden, they all, the government's trying to find these uh, subjects, in other words, people that experiment on because they can't get approved in the United States. They want to bring this new drug in that can control the mind. Right. And make, like, for example, um, all the soldiers do a certain thing, or they want to put in a water supply, you know, mess the water supply so like, everybody's going to listen, like, they want to control everybody. So in order to get this to work, they need to do this discreetly, like, but they can't find like, too many different people to like, you know, approve of this, any prisons or anything like that. So there's one place that allows it, and there's these six random people <clears throat> that have this one, whether it's blood or whatever it is, they have one certain like medical feature in common that would, that would make them eligible to you know, be in this, mm. <clears throat> you know, to do this. And so Harvey and, and uh, Damon didn't even know each other. <clears throat> Harvey's actually a peaceful character. And before all the, you know, they started doing drugs, Damon's like the asshole. He's like, he's 
totally people nobody like at all. Like no one likes them. Yeah. He comes in and he's starting to harass everybody, and they're all they're not getting along. Now the doctor is the one with all the pressure. He's the one that's he he want, he's the one from Russia. He wants to do this experiment. They get the funding from secret societies, all these other different things, but he doesn't know it. Interesting. <laughs> what about secret societies intrigues you, Roman? Just as it's like, could it be real? Could it not be real? Right. It's like, you know, a lot of people look for evidence, things like that, and like and a lot of evidence can be found. Like, all right, that makes perfect sense. I mean, there's no, you can't say these things happen or they, they don't happen. But it's like, I think it's a really, especially if viewers and followers of the film, it's a whole new demographic. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's a big thing right there, as far as w with the government, with you know everything. It's it's really crazy. But some of the when I studied, like so my, my first mate, that's how I even found out all this stuff. And I'm like, all right, how can I make this work? How could Harvey be a cult member or be in a gang or not gang, but like right. have some type of group? So I studied all these different groups for like a couple months and really learned about everything. And then further and further led to like things going on in the country right now. Where I'm like, all right, why not make this really what's going on? Interesting. Um, Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of the process because, um, you know, when I first met you, I was like, this guy, you know, kind of reflection of me, you know, a few few years earlier, just ready to take on the world and taking making a movie is like taking on the world, right. you know, as we both know, it's just like, uh, it's so overwhelming, it's so empowering, you know, the the yin and the yang of it, you know, how do you see? Uh, What's been the biggest ups and the biggest downs for you, if you want to share about the process? The ups would be achieving certain sponsorships, getting one good day of filming done. Yeah. Because we may think it's good, to, like that day, like, all right, it worked out good, but then I'm looking back at it either at home or looking at it, it's not going to make sense if, if we lose location a couple weeks later or something. Excuse me. Most recently, we were shooting in Boston. And the first building we had, we always had a backup, though, because we always knew that they're going to knock it down at one point. With our luck, the same day, morning when everything's finally perfectly going right, it was actually we couldn't go film there, but we always had the back location, ten minutes down the road. That location we had done, we filmed like half the, you know, all the shots that day, and then we're, we're supposed to come back the following week. Monday it burns down somewhere for some reason. So now I'm like, all right, how are we gonna, how am I gonna find this location to match something like tight and something like it looks kind of like, because this was it was a warehouse but it looked like. It could be used for the prison scenes. Right. And then how am I going to find some secure looking or like even, even create something? And then I called a, called a friend of mine. He gave me a, a place. He had an idea, which was the Extreme Airsoft to Wakefield. Okay. And I went down there. It's, it's huge. They have stuff it, it, like there's mills over there connected. Like I use all the property. It's nice. huge, huge. So they even have all the military stuff set up in there. They have all the guns in here, which will get the real effects. So it's not wow. like a fake gun. It'll get the real, you know, everything's going to be 100% real. The troop, the correction type people have all the SWAT gear and everything, the riot shields. We can control the lighting. We don't have to wear out, you know, hurrying up or come back. It's all, we're going to film the entire movie there. Nice. Now, the, the thing that we don't want to gloss over is that literally your Boston location burned. Right. Okay, that's... And when you got, what, what, what was your reaction when you got that phone call or that text? Well, like, Mickey calls me. He's like, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's going, I'm like, all right, just get the point. He's like, who are you with? I'm like, my friend of mine. He's like, what? I'm like, just say it already. He's like, oh, you know, we can't use the location. I'm like, why? Oh, I caught fire. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that pushed, it didn't really push things back because the next filming dates with the budget were a couple weeks late, like, anyway, you know, right. after that. But that was a big throwback in general for me just even trying to find that. Yeah. But we went down there. It's, they were, they're actually really excited about it. That's cool. Um, but. Now, one, one thing you, you were t telling me uh, a couple months ago, we were talking, you were really inspired by, is it Steve Jobs who really inspired you? Right. The computer uh, master businessman. Tell us what about him inspires you. It's more or less like before I even watched the movie that came out, like just what he did, like with technology creations, just having a different vision, like where it was his color. Color was a big factor. Uh, or. Desi you know, certain designs to really feel the emotion of the whatever he was trying to prove. It's like when I watched the movie and actually seeing what this ca this person was like when they're trying to when, when Ashton was like you know in, the, in that character. I'm like, all right, this guy will be that asshole in other words, or be that person that nobody wants to be friends with or nothing, but to make sure the product you know goes on and succeeds. Right. Where he'll tell you you know get out of the room or you're going, you're fired, this and that, or if you're not going to have the vision, then you don't you know leave. Yeah. That's like. Between my knowledge of him already and then actually seeing that movie and just this one scene alone when they fired that guy, I was like, all right, that's the mentality I have to do to make this last and survive. I don't want to be walked over. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste time my money. I have to develop some type of, what's the word for, like, feature that's going to basically keep everything 
aligned and, and balanced. So it's like when we go to set, nobody's wasting time. Nobody's, you know, playing on their phones. Nobody's, it's like, right. cause these shoes are almost $500 a shoot now between, you know, buying uniforms, or even creating them, props, like the prison uniforms, those, those weren't, they weren't that expensive, but still at the same point. Um, then like the cinematographer, that's like 200 bucks right there. The catering is 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah. People's gas. I mean, Wakefield from New Hampshire for some reason. I feel bad oh, for like, for Karen. Yeah. It's like a f almost far driver going on right now. Yeah. So all these little things like add up. So I figured that whether some people, you know, I knew some people weren't going to like how I handle things. But the whole point is, this is the way I want to structure it, and so it stays in a certain balance. It's like I don't care what people do when they're off my time or on my set or something like that. I expect to be respected, and like, and like phones it drives me crazy and all that stuff. Yeah, people doing like that. Yeah, because yeah. I feel like their mind's not in the movie. If their mind's like wondering what's going on their phone, they're not going to focus on the scene. It's like my whole thing is whatever really, is become the character, like as much as you can. Like the night before, I'll basically just really get in the character. Like if I'm talking to somebody, I'll, I'll talk in that character's mindset or talking that like, like tone. One thing I've always, uh, as friends, I've always yeah. been concerned with Roman since I've known you <laughs> since last November. So, is this guy Roman? Does he take on too much himself? And, you know, because some people watching this are familiar with you at this point. You know, they're like, yeah. oh, Roman Vangeli, oh, cool, you know. But how do you feel about that question mark, you know, that people might have? Is, is Roman taking on the world, you know, too much at one time? How do you feel about that question? I feel I'm just doing what's best right now. And I'm still alive. I'm not, like, you know, I'm not too stressed out as much anymore. I mean, I've been through a lot in the past, you know, since November. Yeah. I actually lost my, you know, I put, I, you know, with the fashion business, I did, did very well with that. I built it up. It was successful. It was profiting. Then once that was going good, it's like, all right, I'm going to start a movie. And then all the money I was making went right into the movie, and it broke. I was, like, homeless early. I lived homeless for almost, like, six months. Yeah. Place to place, friends. Even at, you know, you often just let me stay a couple times. Yeah. But I would always make sure the film survived and went on. Like, people don't know these things behind the scenes. I wasn't really homeless at a point when I lived on the street, but it's like, I technically didn't have a place of my own for a certain time. Right. So whether it's like staying at a friend's house or whatever it was, it's like I didn't, you know, a lot of things I sacrificed my own life to make this happen, so not let these people down. So it's like if I'm a certain way with these certain people, it's because I'm giving everything I have, literally, you know, to make this happen. Um, and I'm not, this is the first time I've even spoke of this, like, publicly. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'm at the point where I don't care. I, you know, I am who I am. People don't accept me. They don't accept me. But I'm, right. I'm good now. I'm happy. You know, things happen. You have to make sacrifices. And I, I think that's the whole point that, where, that helps the project a lot. Uh, maybe them knowing now, they'll see why I'm a little crazier at times when it comes to like certain like stri strictness and stuff. You, well, you're a driven individual. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that, whether it's fashion, this movie, uh, weightlifting. Uh, you and Mickey are, are in, well, you're, you're a different type of guy than Mickey. Uh, uh, you're a very driven guy. Not that Mickey's not, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Let's see. So uh, what can people, if people want to get involved in your movie in particular, you know, people out there in the New England area, in, in our kind of part of the world, say, this guy is pretty interesting. He's got something here. This uh, secret society thing is interesting to me. And if, if you want their help, how would uh, they get in touch with you to help with your movie? They just email us at uh, vangeliaent at gmail.com or just message me on Facebook or, or the, one of the pages. Um, right now, I'm actually very strict with what I bring to this film, whether it's even extra, because, like, I've, in the last shoots, we actually, we, when Jimmy got there, he's like, how do you expect us to film all these things in one day? He's like, between all these shots, there's no way. So I had these two people that played correctional officers, and they both have never acted before in their lives. And one decided that they didn't want to be there. And well, this is when I was talking to Jimmy, all of a sudden, I'm like, all right, where'd they go? Right. And they're going, I'm like, all right, well, I was actually going to tell them that we didn't, I don't waste the time, they could have went home for the day because we have, there's no way we can shoot all this between all the coverage. And then they were nowhere to be found. So it's like, I'm very strict to what I bring, because like two people right there, it's, like, I've never, never worked with, and one person gave me a good reference on one, but he, they both like, left for no reason. Yeah. So that, if that, let's say that was the actual, we're going to film all night, and those people are going, how much is to basically last minute get all these people there? I'm trying to organize people from Mass, Connecticut, even uh, one of my actresses, she's from Jersey. She comes down four or five hour trip, just to come down there for, for certain days. So it's like, those little things will, will, will hurt it. So for now I try to only cast through IMDb, through the castings. Okay. I, or else it's, it's cost for the service, but I'd rather just pay and be safe because those people are serious and dedicated. I have better background, see what they've done. It's almost like, well, the resumes are right there, obviously. But that just, it's, for me, I, I feel better with that. Unless it's like, let's say you said, all right, I got a guy that could help right, you out. Right, personal I'll reference. take your word. Yeah, but personal reference. I don't take people's Facebook messages or like, oh, I've, you know, I'm so excited. I, I'd be great to do it because I've heard it so many times and it just causes me problems. Let me ask you this. On a, on a flip side of that, when you're, when you're a young guy, 
because people always ask me, like, you know, and they're probably asking too, what makes you do this? You know, what makes a Mike Messier, Roman Vangeli get into their head, I got to make a movie, and then just keep going, 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 going until the movie is made? How do you answer that? I mean, what, what makes you tick? With this, it's like, it's like the following we built up on it from where it was last year when we first started, where it's like, all right, well, we didn't know what we were doing last year at all, period. Right. And I went to school, so I still know what I was doing. And I'm looking at the old footage, like, all right, we've come a long way. But back then, when it's like, all right, let's turn a reality show, we'll give one last shot and turn it into a movie somehow. And then at that point, we thought it was good and working, working. Then it's like, it's the closer, closer. Again, I'm like, all right, look at what we've done. Now it's like, I know exactly what we're doing now. But it's just, it's, it's just like, I can't let these people down. I can't. Not even, let's say I had a whole new cast. I can't keep my own name right. in this point where I don't want to be the person that doesn't make the movie. I don't want right. to not do it. It's like when I release things, it's because we're actually releasing pictures from on the set. We're not talking about what we're going to make it one day. We're not releasing posters, but not an actual movie. Um, I just want, I don't want to, my name or reputation to go down. I don't want to say something I can't do. I mean, I've said things in the past where I thought they'd be done already, but they take long, but we still do them. But I don't want to be at the point where nothing is done. It's a high stakes poker game. Yeah. And, and what, what I'll try to express for both of us really is when you put yourself on the line, your name, your reputation, and you say, hey, you know, Mike Messier, Roman Vangeli, uh, you know, such and such is making a movie, and then you really want to deliver that movie. And now, you know, for my experience, it's very hard because I've had some things, you know, in my own life that have not come through as planned, and it's very disappointing for me and the people I'm involved with, but you have to brush yourself and move on. And with you, you've just been into redemption and just, just going forward and forward, which is a testimony to you and your willpower that you're just really intent on making this film. Like, I feel like it's become part of me, or it's, it's basically, it's like, it is me. Like, right. basically doing this, because like, I could have my license paid off and like all, all those fines done like over a year now, but I kept putting money into this in production, I kept doing all this, I kept sacrificing all those other things to make the movie happen. So it's like all these choices I make, they're like, obviously I sign up for this, it's my job to do all this and you know, deliver all this, but at the same point I could have done all these different things and had everything going great if I didn't do this film. But it's between the relationship with some of the cast or like that, it's like, it's a good connection and it's just, I can't start so I'm not finish it. You're driven. Right. And that's what I, what's what I remember meeting you uh, last year is this guy is, uh, he's onto something because he believes in himself. Right. And that's what it's all about. Anything you want to say to our audience? Because time just flew by with this interview. Anything you want to say to our audience? Uh, just follow the updates, check up what's going on. It's, it's, we're in process still. We're almost there. I'd say about three, four more filming dates, maybe, maybe six tops. We have this movie wrapped up. We shoot 12 hours, 16 hour days. Um, it's, it's, it's just a, it's a long process. Yeah. It never ends. And then we're only at the filming part now. That's the editing. And I'm just playing around some of the scenes right now to get some test you know, color tones and get an idea of it. Yeah. To actually, you know, see right, how would this look with the colors I want. And like I'm sitting there on the final final cut, I'm like, Phew. it's that's never ending because it's like right. so much footage, so much footage, and I'm bringing back old footage from years ago that I can tie into this. It's a lot. A lot of process. Uh, Roman Vangeli, thank you so much. Yeah. In this episode of the short film showcase, we had two great in studio guests. I want to thank them so much for being on the show, and we saw some great short films. I want to say to all the young people out there, if you're watching our show and you want to be like a Roman Vangeli who just bites into his dream and goes for it, goes for it, remember, all you need to do is get some paper, start writing your script, get a camera, start filming something, get some friends, teach them how to act. Because if you can dream it, shoot it. I'm Mike Messier for Short Film Showcase. <laughs>